Good morning. My name is Richard Kai, and I'm the president and CEO of the Institute of the Americas, located on the UC San Diego campus here in La Jolla, California. On behalf of the Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual launch of our newly published report, Nationally Determined Contributions Across the Americas, a Comparative Hemispheric Analysis. The report highlights progress made by countries across the Western Hemisphere towards fulfilling their climate commitments in anticipation of the forthcoming COP26 Climate Change Conference, which will be held next month in Glasgow. Today's presentation will feature Tanya Miranda, the author of the Institute's NDC report. Tanya serves as the Director of Policy and Stakeholder Engagement for the Institute's Environment and Climate Change Program. Prior to joining the Institute, Tanya worked as an economic analyst for Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Relations with a focus on renewable energy. Tanya is a graduate of USC with a degree in economics. She also earned her master's degree in international public policy from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SICE. Following Tanya's presentation, she'll be followed by four discuss discussants who will share their perspectives on some of the key findings of the Institute's NDC report. Our discussions are, are Sandra Guzman, Sandra um, is manager of Climate Policy Initiatives um, London office. She earned her PhD in politics from the University of York, as well as a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Sandra is a recognized expert in climate finance with a focus in Latin America and was formerly the general director of the government of Mexico's director of climate change policies for their environmental ministry. We also have with us so um, so Sofia Alarcón Diaz. Uh, Sophia is the Director of Latin American Sustainable Finance for IH, um, IHS Marquette in New York, where she supports the company's work in ESG solutions, advising corporate and financial institutions on how to disclose and manage their ESG and climate-related risks. Prior to joining IHS Marquette, Sophia was the Director of the Carbon Trust Mexico. Sophia has also worked for the resources, well, the World Resources Institute in Mexico. She's also served in uh, the government, uh, where she was the director of climate change mitigation policy for the government of Mexico. She also helped them design the, their national uh, emissions register. Uh, we also have with us, with us uh, Thomas Seng. Thomas is a professor, um, and he's currently the uh, director of the University of Ghana's Green Institute. He's also a senior lecturer in the university's Department of Economics. Thomas has worked in academia, the private sector. He's also served in government where he had positions with the Ghana, uh, Guiana uh, Forest Com uh, Commission, Forestry Commission and the Bank of Guiana. Thomas has earned his PhD from the, in economics from the University of Kent. Finally, we have Leonardo Beltran. Leonardo was the deputy secretary for planning and energy transition um, for the government of Mexico under the administration of Ernesto Peña Nieto. Um, he's had a variety of, um, of roles um, in government. Um, he also he served, for example, as chief planning officer and chief technology officer for um, the Mexican energy sector um, and also had responsibilities with Pemex and CFE. He has a degree uh, in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, a bachelor's of science uh, degree from ITAM, and also earned his law degree from UNAM. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Tanya so she can um, share her report findings and, um, and we look forward to your participation today. So with this, um, Tanya, take it away. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you to everyone that's listening today. And thank you, of course, to my wonderful panelists. It's a true honor for me uh, to be able to share this space with you, to be honest. Okay, um, so it's, it's a pleasure to, to introduce this paper that will be published today uh, by the Institute of the Americas called Nationally Determined Contributions Across the Americas, a Comparative Hemispheric Analysis. A little bit of why we are, are doing this paper is um, we are under three weeks away from the UN Conference on Climate Change 26, known as COP26, but we're also six years into the signing of the Paris Agreement and according to Article 4.2 of the agreement, every five years, all signatory countries must review and increase the ambition of their international climate pledges, which are known as nationally determined contributions. And in that sense, we thought it was also necessary for us as civil society to revise the country progress and updated pledges 
in an effort to understand the regional trends as well as challenges and opportunities moving forward so that we can contribute to, to the climate uh, debate. With that in mind, then the Institute undertook this assessment of different components relative to those NDCs of, uh, of countries in, in the Americas. Also with a brief overview of Latin America and the Caribbean's emissions and natural capital profile, um, the, the, the region is only responsible for about 7% of global emissions, from which around 88% come from energy, from land use change, and from the agriculture sector. The highest emitters are Brazil, which is responsible for around 2.25% of global emissions, followed by Mexico, uh, which is responsible for about 1.5% of, of total emissions. Together, these two countries account for around half of the region uh, climate pollution. North America is responsible for 75% of the, of the hemisphere emissions, South America for around 22%, and the remaining 3% comes from uh, the Caribbean and Central America. As a percentage of, of global yearly emissions, LAC is responsible for 7%, yet it holds around 25% of the world's forest cover. The idea of this graph is for you to, to have an idea of, of the enormous potential that the region has to leverage nature for, for climate mitigation. The region also houses almost half of the world's to total tropical forests, and Brazil alone holds a third of, of the entire tropical forest in the world. The sequestration potential from blue carbon in LAC is also very important. Brazil and Mexico are the second and fourth countries respectively with the highest mangrove extension globally. We know that ocean and land ecosystems remove from the atmosphere around half of anthropogenic CO2 yearly emissions, and that is why these are so important in the climate change debate. Yet in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, blue carbon and forests are degrading at high rates due to land, un, land use pressures. Uh, this year, the, the news came out that the Brazilian Amazon is already a net carbon emitter. And we also know that in the last 18 years, about 20% of the mangrove extension in Latin America was already lost. Before I, I get into the NDC analysis of the report, I'd like to at least mention briefly a few of the challenges and opportunities that we identified in, in Latin America and the Caribbean and that we discuss in the report because they are key to determining the region's future emissions pathway. Uh, the first, the first uh, challenge that we talk about is rising electricity demand paired with declining hydropower capacity. Hydropower is the largest source of renewables in the region, and it ranges from 50% of renewable energy production in Uruguay to 70% in places like Brazil and Colombia, and 100% in other countries like Paraguay and Costa Rica. However, climate change is putting in danger the future availability and predictability of this natural resource as rainfall patterns change, glaciers melt, and, and temperatures rise. The effect will be much worse in the southernmost part of South America, as well in, uh, as in Central America and Mexico. So it just speaks about the risk and the vulnerability of power supply in the region if these trends continue. The second challenge that we, that we talk about is a reliance on many of these countries uh, on fossil fuels and the transitional risks that this can bring. It's of course a very intricate topic and, and unfortunately I don't have much time to go into it, but it's important to mention that some of these countries will face risk, fiscal risks soon if they keep relying on, on extractive rents from mainly oil and gas. Not to mention the fact that if they are keep under, uh, to keep undergoing oil and gas projects in, in the region, they would, their emissions uh, trajectories could be put at risk and it would also put in danger their, their climate pledges made for the Paris agreements. The third and, and last challenge that we speak about on the report is the climate finance gap. Uh, yearly climate finance provided and mobilized by developed countries and the private sector for the developing world total less than $100 billion from a pledge that was supposed to reach the $100 billion per year since 2020. And just to give you an idea, Mexico's estimated NDC implementation costs and the resources it earmarks yearly for climate action, uh, it means that it has a ballpark funding gap uh, for climate action of around $6 billion per year for the implementation of its unconditional commitments and for actions related to mitigation, not, not even inclusive of, of the adaptation actions. 
And this just speaks about the critical needs for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to one, commit more funding of their own, but also to find more resources elsewhere if they are to achieve their, their stated climate goals. We also mentioned briefly in the report uh, what's going on in US and Canada in terms of climate funding as the two most developed uh, nations in, in the hemisphere. Both governments have recently made new pledges to increase their direct foreign assistance for climate action in developing nations. Yet this is not remotely close to the needs in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, for instance, the US has earmarked for 2022 only $133 million for Latin America and the Caribbean. And we argue that there are strategic reasons to engage more in, in this region because of national interests they have. For instance, US, the US imports more than 80% of fruits and 85% of its vegetables from, from Latin America. And that means that the resilience of the agri-food systems in the region is clearly relevant to, to the future of, of US uh, food security. In terms of strategic opportunities that we identify and talk about in the report, we start with sustainable agricultural practices. As a world largest food net exporting region, agriculture has a potential to become an agent of growth and jobs in Latin America. Yet it is today an important contributor to emissions in the region, and it uses a lot of its availability of freshwater resources, which as we, as we saw before, it will become even more unreliable and scarce as droughts plague certain regions of the continent and demand in other sector increases too. The region needs to optimize the use and sustainability of, of natural resources and ecosystem services in order to mitigate the impact of the agricultural sector, while at the same time, it needs to adapt it for a changing and warming climate. The other uh, opportunity that we talk about are the renewable energy systems in, in the region. The Latin America's unique situation means that the region could take advantage of the appetite for green investments and the boom around the world in, in new climate finance mechanisms given the availability of carbon sinks and clean energy potential for green hydrogen, for geothermal, wind and solar resources, as well as the fact that emissions will be growing in the region as it continues to grow. The, the third opportunity that we talk about um, is nature-based solutions. And a relevant finding that came from our scorecard analyses is that all but one country in Latin America, not including the Caribbean, have natural capital as a percentage of the world's total that far exceeds their percentage of global yearly emissions. So as one of the most mega diverse regions in the world, this makes a strong case to invest in nature-based solutions projects in, in the region uh, as it provides ample opportunities to pursue cost-effective mitigation strategies while at the same time conserving the mass amount of biomass in, in the region. Uh, here I show the, the 16 countries that we profile in the report. They collectively represent 90% of the America's population and 98% of the America's GDP. This is an example of the country profiles that we came up with, um, but on, on the top we have a few key statistics. Um, for example, we have total GDP as well as per capita GDP. We show a brief, uh, easy to read graph on percentage of global emissions versus percentage of global forest cover um, to put things in perspective. We also talk about the, the country's ranking in terms of total greenhouse gas emissions and per capita emissions as well. On the left-hand side, we make a quick comparison of the country's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets from the first submission that they made um, and the updated, updated version of the NDCs. And the third rectangle also talks about adaptation targets and, and actions that they commit to. In the middle section, we talk about relevant legislation as well as regulations implemented and recent developments um, that are pertaining uh, climate action in the, in the country. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll find the NDC scorecard, which um, which scores seven different components relative to the NDCs in a very simple yes, no, or insufficient category. This is a, a version of the regional scorecard that, that came out of our analyses and, and the methodology on how certain categories were measured and all the country resources can be found on a note 
in the report's website. Um, so I encourage you to, to look at it. And there are some clear trends that came out from, from this regional scorecard. We, we can see on, on the first uh, component that all but three Caribbean nations um, have submitted updated NDCs at the time of writing previous to COP26. Uh, it was all but Haiti, Guyana, and Trinidad. Um, as far as the mitigation component, we can see that all but Brazil's and Mexico's NDCs were more ambitious. And in terms of, um, of adaptation, we can see that only Brazil did not update and increase its ambition. I, I won't go into each of, of these countries, but this shows uh, what we saw in terms of climate leadership in the region. And all these countries uh, submitted NDCs that are much more ambitious in terms of adaptation and mitigation also in terms of the amount of resources that they're committing unconditionally to climate action, as well as in, in greening measurable targets into their national legislations. Uh, in terms of the laggards in the region, um, I don't think it's to anyone's surprise, but the two largest economies in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, which are responsible for over 50% of, emiss of emissions are the ones that did not increase ambition after five years of, of signing the agreement. The good for uh, the Mexican NDC is that it included for the first time cross-cutting strategies for nature-based solutions, which is a very um, innovative thing that not many countries have done. And for Brazil, it's regarding its long-term recovery spending of COVID-19, um, which has one of the, of the highest spending in, uh, towards green measures. As, as far as uh, net zero timelines, it's definitely encouraging. Uh, we have 11 out of the 16 countries that we looked at had established uh, a mid-century timeline for achieving net zero. Uh, the only caveat here is that only Canada has ingrained the pledge in its national legislation. Um, so otherwise there's really no assurance or plan or the funding to back the pledge. Um, Costa Rica has, has ingrained it in its national decarbonization plan and it's making good progress with it. And Chile is considering currently ingraining also this pledge into law. Um, in terms of COVID-19 recovery spending, it's uh, like I said, it's not very encouraging. The only country that has spent more than half of its COVID-19 recovery spending on green measures was Canada. But aside from that, the numbers in the region were very low. There were even five countries whose green recovery spending is close to zero. And that just speaks about a missed opportunity to align long-term spending with, with the climate goals. All this information uh, to make this assessment came from the UN Environment Program's COVID-19 Recovery Tracker and from the Global Recovery Observatory by Oxford University. In terms of conditionality, uh, some, Actually, most developing countries make a portion of its mitigation commitments uh, contingent upon receiving international and foreign aid and funding. And the only four countries, uh, there were only four countries that made 100% unconditional commitments, three in South America and Costa Rica. Um, notably, Jamaica increased the unconditional component substantially in its updated NDCs, as well as Barbados that went from a fully conditional target to only 50% conditional. Um, and uh, aside from that, the high level of conditionality means that these climate pledges will also largely rely on the developed world. And it's something to keep in mind by the international community. A few final thoughts that I'd love for you to, um, to leave this webinar with is uh, in terms of climate finance need in the region, which are, are the, in, in the order of billions. And unfortunately, COVID-19 hit the region the hardest, and this will put at risk many of, of the NDC implementations. In that sense, they would need to engage with the international community and in COP26 particularly to make a case of the multiple opportunities they have um, in Latin America and the Caribbean for cost-effective mitigation by leveraging ecosystems. Otherwise, 2050 will come and the 1.5 degrees Celsius target will most likely be very far away. And yes, the financing and implementing of the NDCs will bring heavy costs for the region. Um, but ju just to, to keep on with the example that I already mentioned, um, Mexico undertook an assessment in 2019 regarding the NDC implementation costs. 
that showed that a business as usual scenario in which it did not implement the NDCs would bring reduced economic growth, uh, different consumption patterns coupled with ecosystem and natural capital degradation that cost the country in the order of $143 billion by 2030. And the study concluded too that implementing its NDCs would actually bring net benefits or negative costs to its economy. In the same sense, Colombia's Ministry of Environment also recently came up with information um, that points out to the fact that without investing heavily in adaptation now, will cost Colombia up to $4 billion a year. So this just speaks about the need to act now, or else the costs will be higher the more we take to act. And the same will be for, for most of the countries in the region because of their profiles. Um, in that sense, the region needs to become a leader in biosphere stewardship now and needs to make the case on why the developed world has a stake on this too. That's it on, on my presentation. Um, the link to, to our website is right there. We'll be sending an email blast later uh, to everyone that, that uh, connected to this webinar so you can visit it. I encourage you to do so. It has a lot of cool and, and very resourceful um, things like case studies talking about climate impacts that the region is suffering. Um, we also have interactive maps and graphs where, where you can get a sense of what's going on in each country. So I, I hope you found it interesting. I hope you visit our website and I'll take you back to Richard Kai so that we can talk to our expert panelists today. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for an excellent presentation at this time. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Sandra Guzman, who will share her observations on the report and her perspectives on Latin America and uh, climate action. Sandra, take it away. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you so much, Tanya and colleagues, for, for the invitation to, to, to comment in this uh, about this amazing work that Tanya conducted. So congratulations for all this hard work. Um, I would like to focus my, my presentation or my, my comments around the difficulty to actually implement NDCs. One of the key things that we have been discussing around the world is the necessity to put together these NDCs that, as you know, are vol voluntarily uh, mechanisms that countries are adopting. But the UNFCCC has already telling us that the NDCs that were submitted so far are not enough to stabilize emissions and avoid an increase in, of more than 1.5 degrees Celsius in the temperature. The problem in Latin America is that, yes, most of the countries submitted their NDCs, but most of them, except the case of Costa Rica, are, a, let's say, are not aligned to this scenario of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is extremely dangerous in, in the international context. But the main problem is that it's not only that they are not aligned, but the other problem is that they don't necessarily have implementation mechanisms, implementation strategies to say, okay, how much are these mechanisms or how much are these NDCs uh, gonna cost? Uh, because as Tania was highlighting, very few countries have been analyzing the actual cost of the mitigation and adaptation mechanisms. Uh, so now we don't have necessarily strategies that will that explain how these countries are going to implement these NDCs. So a very important point in this in this moment is what is what these developing countries, these Latin American countries, need to implement these um, NDCs, and to what extent they are willing to really comply with the, with the unconditional me measures, because as Tanya was mentioning, most of the countries, including these conditional and unconditional me measures, unconditional means that they can do it with their own resources. However, based in an analysis that we conducted um, in, in the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean, we discovered that not, not any, any of, the, of the major emitters in the region are spending enough money, enough uh, national resources to implement sustainable policies, including, of course, climate change policy. So the, the countries are not necessarily investing enough resources, even though they are submitting uh, unconditional measures. On the other hand, they are including these unconditional, sorry, conditional measures. That means that they would need the support internationally 
But as you, as you were mentioning, the key problem is that international support, international finance is not enough to comply or to achieve all the mechanisms included in the NDCs. And besides that, the international finance uh, that arrives to Latin America is, is very unbalanced in terms of allocation. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see that the, the two countries that receive most of the climate finance flows in Latin America are Mexico and Brazil. And Tanya was sharing with us that Mexico and Brazil are the ones that are lagging, are not necessarily uh, increasing the ambition of their measures or their NDCs. However, they are still receiving a lot of climate finance flows. And this is going to be quite interesting to analyze, uh, not only in coming years, but like to see what is the effect of this lack of ambition in terms of, of receiving or not enough resources to implement these NDCs. And another key element that, that Tania was highlighting that for me is a, a major uh, element that, that we, we need to analyze deeper and deeper, it's precisely this fact that most of the countries in the region rely a lot in fossil fuel to generate revenues. Uh, even Costa Rica, that is a very carbon, um, low carbon intense uh, country, even Costa Rica relies uh, at least three, or three to five percent of, of the sales of gasoline to generate revenues, which means that all our region needs to rethink how we are going to generate more and better revenues to pay for whatever need we need to pay in health, education, and of course, environmental policies. So it's how we are going to transform our economies to not only uh, have these ambitious uh, climate policies, but actually how we are going to transform our economies to invest uh, wisely in what needs to be uh, done, uh, not only in the context of, of climate change, but of course, in the context of the pandemic. Um, a major element that, that we observed uh, in, in the last couple of years is that instead of thinking in the pandemic as an opportunity to change, to reframe the narrative around climate change, most of the countries started to uh, or, or intensify in a way their reliance or the consumption of fossil fuels. And this is the case of Argentina. This is the case of Colombia. This is a case of Mexico. Uh, they went back to the fossil fuel industry to generate revenues to keep like uh, the, the paying for the debts that the pandemic brought. So I think it's very important to, to see that it's, it's necessary to change the, the, the not only the, the actual uh, elaboration of the policies and the narrative, but it's very important to start connecting the different dots. If we are in a moment uh, that, the, that the pandemic is giving us the opportunity to rethink the, the actual, um, the future of all our sectors, including the energy sector. So now the, the key task for the region is try to transform, try to embrace these opportunities of, of change and rethink. We know that fossil fuels are not the exit. We know that we don't have enough resources to, you know, like to, to really uh, cover all the demands in the future. So it's how countries are going to start uh, transforming, investing their national resources to better invest in these transformational processes. Of course, international money is very important, and we cannot deny that. Developed countries have a major responsibility to developing countries to, to provide not only these 100 billions that are in the table, but as you know, we are going to discuss a new goal on climate finance internationally, and we know that 100 billions are not enough. We have to discuss for further and more a, a bigger goal, but this is not, all, not only about international money. I think it's time that developing countries only also embrace this problem, embrace the, the crisis, and mainstreams climate change in their national processes, including planning and budgeting processes. So it's how we are going to start spending more money, particularly for the adaptation case. As Tanya was saying, many countries are including mitigation mechanisms, uh, but now we know that mitigation and adaptation have to be at the same level. However, around 80% of the mitigation flow, around 80% of the flows are dedicated to mitigation and only, and only 20 or less to adaptation. In many countries, this, this is very evident, even in countries that are highly vulnerable. So I think it's very important that Latin America takes opportunity to transform uh, the whole cycle, starts mainstreaming climate change in an effective way, and see the NDCs as an opportunity to change the trajectory. And I would conclude saying 
that we, have, we don't have to think only in the NDCs. We have to think in the long-term strategies as well, because remember that the NDCs have this short kind of a perspective. So we have to see how these NDCs are part of these long-term strategies for the future and make them consistent and try to really, really transform uh, beyond the, the governmental periods, but beyond like the, the actual uh, scope of the governments that are in, in, in the power at the moment. So a lot of challenges in the region. We're very happy to, to be here to keep this conversation. Thank you so much for the invitation. Sandra, thank you so much. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Sofia Alarcón Diaz, who will provide her thoughts and perspectives. Uh, Sofia? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And I'm very glad to, to be part of this panel. I just want to start by congratulating Tania and the Institute of Americas for this great, great paper. I think it's going to be of benefit to all the countries in Latin America that are working on their climate strategy. So I just I want to start with uh, a few points that Tanya already mentioned around this um, uh, paper. So one of the, the things that I really liked about this paper is that you mentioned adaptation. We usually talk about mitigation and tons of CO2 equivalent reduced, but adaptation is actually one of the biggest challenge, challenges for Latin American countries, especially the Caribbean countries. So um, we are very reliant on climate finance to actually get that achieved. But we've seen that at least 90% of the resources that are used for finance are used for only mitigation. So that part of the equation needs to, needs to change at some point of time because climate change is already happening. So we need to adapt as soon as possible. And something that, I, that you mentioned in, in your presentation, Tania, that really um, was surprising. I mean, not surprising, but it's very important to take into account. Black, Latin America and the Caribbean is the world's largest food net exporting region. So what's going on for food security? We need to take into account the adaptation challenges that Latin America and the Caribbean will be facing. So also, I like that uh, you mentioned the challenges, but also the opportunities across all sectors. So it's not only transportation, because we know that in our countries, the greatest source, source of greenhouse gas emissions comes from transportation, but it's not the only one. We have land use, we have agriculture, we have industry, and of course, electricity. So you touch upon these sectors, and that makes it very robust, very comprehensive in, that, in such sense. And it's, it's very sad to hear that well, Brazil and Mexico, which are usually the leading countries when it comes to climate, are the laggards. But uh, this may change at some point of time, like investors, the private sector is pushing for this. So this has to change at some point of time. And it's good to see that Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Barbados, and Chile are the most ambitious, but we need more, right? So. I have a few comments around the carbon pricing instruments. So these countries in Latin America are working on climate strategies, but we need carbon pricing instruments to make this work. Otherwise, it's just uh, good intentions in papers. But there are various challenges around carbon pricing instruments in the region, right? So first of all, we need to have the political will to have carbon pricing instruments, either in the form of an ETS, an emissions trading system, or a carbon tax. And we've seen examples in Argentina, in Colombia, in Chile, and Mexico of carbon taxes. And these countries, especially Colombia and Mexico, are already designing their emissions trading systems. They will be operating in, in one or two years' time, not the pilots. I'm talking about the pilots. So we need to see these, uh, these carbon instruments in two levels. So it's the political will and the technical level. So in the political will, we can have, of course, the top management, the vice ministers, um, proactively speaking about carbon pricing instruments. But when it comes to really design the carbon pricing instrument, we'll face challenges, right? We need an MRV system in place. We need to work with the private sector. We need to identify which type of offsets will be part of these, or nature-based solutions will be part of this conversation, right? So there are plenty of technical decisions countries will have to take. And for that to happen, they need capacity building. Right, so how that is gonna work? Well, we have the Paris Agreement, we have the, the, the regulatory framework at the international level to make that happen. There's, there should be technology transfer uh, and even, even capacity building from developed countries to developing countries, of course. So um, 
we need to uh, design how the caps in the case of emissions trading systems will become a reality? Is it a carbon intensity or an absolute target? Are we including the oil and gas sectors? Like Sandra was mentioning, we are reliant on oil and gas, um, right? The sectors in Latin America to get uh, funding, right? So how are we going to uh, make them part of this strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? We need carbon pricing instruments at the end, right? So how much are we going to in include them into these, in these type of conversations, right? So the other conversation is how are we going to basically transition from a carbon tax in the case of Colombia and Mexico to an ETS? In case they want to transition, they may want to have both types of instruments, right? And the regulatory frameworks. What is the what is the foundation for having these type of instruments in in Latin America, right? There could be a law. We have laws in in Latin America, Mexico, Colombia. Chile is already working. Uh, on that, but we need that regulatory framework to be translated into secondary laws, right? Into reglamentos, into um, specific laws that target sectors or that target specific thresholds of greenhouse gas emissions. So that is a real challenge. And for most countries, it has been, um, there has been some delays because the change of government, because there are not enough resources. But and just to wrap up my comments, what I really like about this paper is that it also touches upon the comparison, right, of many other countries. I remember that when I was a decision maker at the Minister of Environment in Mexico, um, and the, the NDC of Mexico was shaped or framed into the conditional and non-conditional targets. And then that was replicated in Chile, in Peru, and in other countries around the world. So that Mexican model uh, was was uh, a message to the world saying we need resources from the world, right? It was replicated. And then Chile, for instance, in the updated NDC, they dropped that, the conditional and non-conditional, because it's really hard to account the conditional versus the non-conditional. So again, I go back to the technical conversation. Uh, it takes time to define that, but at the end, we need to, to trigger the adequate elements to have those elements in place to, to provide the resources and the action in, in Latin America. Sophia, thank you, thank you so much for your, your comments. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, Thomas, uh, Shea, at this time, we'd, we'd love you to, to share your perspective um, on the NDC report and your reflections on climate action in, the, in Latin America and particularly the Caribbean where you're based. Thank you very much. I would like to see that among the other things, um, the very timing of this report, quite apart from the exceptional work that was done by um, Tanya, yeah. make this a rather very significant event. Because yes, indeed, uh, the COP26 is coming up in a few days' time. And the challenges of the global climate um, mechanisms and the mechanisms to address global ch climate change have been with us for a long time. What can very well happen here is that a, a, a report as simple as, it's not a simple report, pardon me, uh, a, a report such as the one that Tanya has produced could become a focal point um, for action even within Latin American and Caribbean countries. I want to compliment Tanya for a very well-researched report and to compliment both her and the Institute of Americas for ensuring that the timing is so significant and in my view, right. Um, the challenges that will be faced can be probably characterized on two fronts as agency challenges, if you will, and the nuts and bolts of cooperation. Previous speakers have adverted to these things and Tanya, I think your report captured it in an exceptionally good way because there was a natural tendency for the reader to want to compare the mega rich biodiversity of the um, um, Latin American Caribbean countries and the position of the United States within the hemisphere. Um, and in a real sense, that has become the point of departure for my own consideration of what might happen at COP26, what might happen as we deal with the problems of um, climate change and what might happen in our particular region. Um, so so the, 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 the trajectory of the mechanisms 
way back when from Kyoto and probably before, have been in the nature of pledge and review, this sort of expectation, hope that, well, there'll be a ratcheting up of voluntary contributions. That incidentally is still there. Um, it's still at the back of the minds of people. But as the previous speaker mentioned, the idea of carbon pricing goes beyond that. And it deals frontally with the, the weakness of the pledge and review framework, a weakness that has a lot to do with our inability to enforce commitments. I mean, I, I've been a bit confused over the fact that well, the Paris Agreement is, is a legal instrument, yes, indeed, but the enforcement mechanisms just aren't there. And, and Tanya, in your report, especially your comment about Brazil and Mexico um, is, is a lesson, if you will, uh, a lesson about the, the difficulty of having pledge and review sort of mechanisms. Um, the other thing is that the nuts and bolts of cooperation dictate that or, or it's, it's, it's the analytical framework. The framework is precisely the one that invites free riding. Let me pause by saying that the COVID phenomenon and the global response to it has shown that cooperation on a large scale is indeed possible. Yes, indeed, there's been competition for financing, for fiscal um, resources, but I think that the whole process of dealing with our large scale global challenges requires that we reflect and we learn. And we should particularly think about the lessons from COVID have to do with cooperation. While yes, indeed, there are concerns about the distribution of the, 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 the vaccinations, for example, I think that we can say that there, this has been an unmitigated success story of cooperation. And um, we need to learn from that. And one of the things we can learn is to, to, to see the importance of galvanizing around a common commitment. Something that was averted to in the previous, by the previous speaker. It's very important in, in, in the context of free riding problems for us to coalesce around a common commitment. This indeed has been the, the call um, coming out of the IMF in its recent IMF note, that we should think about having something in the nature of a uniform minimum floor. There is an, an idea of um, reciprocity and the importance of reciprocity in getting us to coalesce around something like a price in carbon. And, and I'll close by saying that, that, because I think I've run out of time, um, by saying that we can think of the carbon price as presenting an opportunity for us to arrive at a common floor, a common price that will be particularly in the nature of a, a common commitment that we ratchet it up if, if we indeed approach things um, on the basis of I will, if you will, reciprocity. Richard, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to um, uh, present um, Leonardo Beltran, who will uh, share some of his perspectives on the NDC report and, uh, and his observations in general about where Mexico and Latin America stand in terms of climate action. Yes, thanks very much, Richard. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, Tanya. It's a great opportunity for me to, to actually read the, the paper. I think it's a very fresh and timely viewpoint of what Latin America and several countries can do to uh, continue uh, this path towards uh, net zero. I, I would like to focus first on the, uh, the main topic of, of the report, which is it's a matter uh, focusing on the indices is a matter of competitiveness if we talk about that today. But if we talk about the same topic tomorrow, it would be survivability. So today, uh, you know, the result of our, uh, for instance, uh, clean power generation is 
we are uh, the, the cleanest uh, uh, power portfolio generating uh, region worldwide. And that's not unusual because we are one of the most uh, mega diverse regions worldwide. So today, uh, the result of having that uh, wealth of natural capital is actually the opportunity for us to continue to rely on our natural resources and continue to create uh, virtuous cycles, which uh, it's part of the conversation that uh, Tanya very aptly put uh, forward in the report. The other, uh, of course, elements is regarding the competitiveness of, of our region. Uh, today, we have the cleanest generation portfolio, yes. And uh, today, also, we have um, renewables as the most competitive technologies for power generation worldwide. So um, if we are to continue to uh, follow this path, net zero generating path, it will actually contribute to competitiveness. So uh, that's the perfect opportunity for the region to actually continue to lead by example and perhaps come uh, in a compact group uh, as a GRULAC, the Latin American Caribbean group uh, before COP26 and uh, express that leadership by increasing the commitments uh, in terms of, let's say, power generation. Uh, today, uh, close to uh, a little bit over six out of every 10 megawatts that are uh, generated in the region come from renewable resources. So there's an opportunity to continue to rely on our natural capital, to continue to be competitive if uh, we are to take advantage of the natural resources or the renewable resources we have. And then actually it's an opportunity to uh, pledge and not only pledge, but act upon those competitive advantages that we have in, in the region. Uh, the other component is not only about the wealth of resources that we have, but also the experience that we have in terms of regulatory uh, environment. Uh, the region actually was pioneer in uh, long-term power auctions. Uh, so as a result, we have been observing different uh, competitive auctions uh, happening across uh, the entire region from uh, all the way from the US to Argentina and uh, Brazil uh, actually uh, developing more than 20, 25 uh, power auctions in the, the last uh, 20 years. And in each of those auctions, uh, what we have seen is uh, record uh, prices in, in terms of, of um, the lowest uh, and the most competitive prices, uh, not only for the region, but worldwide. So we have seen uh, Latin America uh, grow, uh, showing that uh, we can follow the learning path uh, on power generation and renewable power and also being able to set prices worldwide. So uh, we do not only have the resources, but we do have also the experience and, and the model that can actually help us uh, increase the ambition and become a, a, a powerhouse for a renewable energy, certainly, but also for a regulatory a processes that can actually develop and produce a competitive prices worldwide. So in that sense, is the, again, today is not a matter of a, uh, an esoteric um, conversation, but it's a matter of competitiveness. And if we are to uh, build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic, the perfect opportunity for Latin America uh, is to actually rely and partner with our natural capital 
and continue to promote these uh, long-term power auctions, for instance, for uh, power generation, to continue to have um, attractive uh, environments for investments to come into the region, but for investments to thrive and those investments to become uh, the, the platform for the different regions to um, re rethink and pivot from a hydrocarbon production to renewable generation. So moving from barrels to watts, and that's the path towards net zero. So congratulations again, Tanya, for this very fresh and timely report. And thanks very much, Chris, for the opportunity to address the audience. You know, thank you. Uh, at this time, I welcome all of the uh, panelists to turn on your cameras. Um, I want to start with Sophia. Uh, Sophia, you, you talked about uh, market mechanisms. Uh, two thirds of all the Paris Agreement signatories have included market mechanisms in terms of their NDCs. But you also spoke about some of the challenges in Latin America related to political will and also t and also just the technical capacity. I want to talk. I want to see if you could reflect on on some of the leaders in Latin America that are implementing successfully um, market mechanisms towards meeting their NDCs, some of the challenges that you see, you spoke about Mexico and Brazil getting the bulk of, of green bond financing, but nevertheless are laggards in terms of climate uh, commitment and ambition. So um, Sophia, welcome some of your reflections on, um, on these points in this question. Of course. So, yeah, I think, um, well, in terms of the leaders implementing these type of carbon pricing instruments, we have Chile, we have uh, Colombia, Ar uh, Argentina to some extent, but I would say Mexico. So these are the countries that are sort of working hard and in, in designing since a few years ago, uh, their carbon pricing instruments. They started with a carbon tax and now they are designing their emissions trading systems. In, various forms, but something that um, I would flag about, for instance, and linking this with Article 6, because at the end, we have the regulatory framework at the international level, which is the Paris Agreement. Something that countries should be looking at is how they create partnerships, how they create regional corporate cooperation, right? Uh, Peru, for instance, has been, has been very outspoken about that. They uh, recently signed an agreement with Switzerland to start working on a pilot for Article 6. So that's another way of working on carbon markets. It's not necessarily an ETS or carbon tax, but it's a way of looking ahead at, at how uh, carbon pricing instruments would look like. This is more in terms of offsets. So Switzerland is looking for offsets in the developing world, like Peru, to sort of uh, achieve their the it, their net zero target or their climate strategy. So I think that's one. Article 6 also provides us with flexibility, which is also important when we talk about carbon pricing instruments, right? Now, Article 6 talks about non-market and market mechanisms. So when we talk about market mechanisms, it's mainly ETSs, carbon taxes, carbon offsets, supply and demand. But there is also the non-market mechanisms, which pertain uh, topics such as technology transfer, capacity building, which is necessary as well to deploy the use of carbon credits or the, the design and development of carbon pricing instruments in Latin America. So at the end, uh, countries like Mexico and Brazil, which at the end are laggards at this point of time, they could rely on these type of mechanisms to keep working, to keep designing their own carbon instruments they may call it uh, offsets or allowances or ETSs or carbon taxes or performance traded standards or any other type. But at the end, what we are looking to have is mitigation action, right? It, it really depends on how a country uh, names it. So uh, Brazil may be looking more at the land use type of uh, transfer of funds rather than uh, offsets. Mm -hmm. And Mexico may be looking at other type of, of carbon pricing instruments like an ETS or carbon taxes. Mm -hmm. There's flexibility on that. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Sandra, I have a question for you. Given your background in climate finance um, and, and some of the comments you made related to um, uh, challenges that some of the countries are facing in terms of their own budgetary commitments and, and aligning them to um, um, climate resilient strategies, 
um, the dependence by some countries in Latin America towards extractive industries to, to cover their, um, their public um, obligations. I wanted to talk about some of the, um, the uh, opportunities for, um, for climate action in, in countries like Mexico, like Brazil, Ecuador, that, um, that, that continue to rely on, on extractive industries uh, to cover their, their, their public um, um, budget. At the same time, also, um, I'd also like you to respond to a question we received from Patrick from the New Statesman, a, a publication in the UK, where you're from, um, and wanted to know what the U UK can do um, to support decarbonization transition for Latin American countries in anticipation of the COP, um, given that the UK is hosting the COP26. Um, I think it's an appropriate question. So, um, Sandra, welcome your thoughts. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, let me clarify. I'm from Mexico. I mean, I'm based in the UK. I know you're based I'm in the UK. I know you're, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest opportunity that Latin America has is to create new ways of generate uh, revenues. Now, obviously we have to start thinking in better fiscal policies that are related to a total new industries. For instance, uh, Leonardo was talking about the amazing opportunity that the region has to, for instance, develop uh, a national industries related to renewable energy, like uh, producing their own technologies, producing their own uh, capacities, uh, like across the, in this South kind of South-South cooperation approach. I mean, Latin America has a massive opportunity to change and not only that generate new 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 jobs uh, related to these new industries even uh, natural based uh, solutions uh, jobs how can we make the most of of our nature like for instance in the amazon there are so many initiatives like to, to generate uh, new jobs related to the protection of the Amazon instead of extracting activities. So I think that's precisely, uh, those are the, the approaches that countries have to follow, thinking not only in the short term, but actually now uh, countries have to think in the mid and the long term. Uh, and I think there are a few uh, initiatives that are helping uh, to frame what could happen in the in the future uh, and now it's a matter of of not only connecting what is happening internationally what would is happen locally but like trying to really um tr translate better no and i think the the i would like to highlight the important role of the local governments i mean i think the local governments have a major uh, role to play in all of these um, uh, new kind of fiscal policies budgeting policies in all these kind of emission of of of, of local bonds and a lot of uh, activities that local states can actually uh, promote at the, at the local level to, to transform and to take advantage of, of, of all of this. Um, and yes, I definitely think that the UK uh, as well as other developed countries have to, have to comply with the commitments, have to comply with what they already agreed, not only the 100 billions that we were discussing just now, but like how much needs to, needs to flow to the developing world and, and I think definitely international resources in the UK will it has the UK actually has very important uh, agreements with Colombia, with Mexico, with Peru, with Argentina. So now it's it's a matter of how to make the international cooperation more effective. It's not only a matter of of more money, but how to improve the allocation of that money, where the money is it's going, you know, like it's, it's arriving to the local communities, it's arriving where the money is needed, or it's just flowing around without necessarily having the, the impacts that we want to see. So I think international cooperation has the biggest opportunity to transform for complete what is happening. And I think the COP will be a, a very interesting point to, to, to hopefully it's going to be a milestone to keep transforming this relationship between countries because now it's not a matter of developed versus developing countries. Now we all know that if we don't collaborate, if we don't work together, this is a matter of survival for humanity. You know, it's not only this point in, in, in who is against who, but I think the COP uh, hopefully will be a major opportunity to, to reinvent this uh, cooperation in the coming years. With that, I want to thank um, our panelists, uh, Sandra, Sofia, Thomas, Leonardo. Um, I also want to give special thanks to Tanya Miranda for her excellent um, NDC report, and all of you for tuning in. Um, on behalf of the Institute of the Americas, um, I appreciate your participation, and we look forward to you um, participating in future um, Institute of America events. Thank you very much, and have a good day.